I can you can see the PPT? Yes, yes. He just okay. Uh, he Good just afternoon, uh, everybody. Uh, Good afternoon to everybody. Uh, after a lot of struggle, we have ultimately got into this. Uh, it's, a, it's a privilege always to talk on poverty because I spent all my life on uh, working on poverty in different countries. Today I'm going to talk on uh, uh, poverty, the brain of poverty education in India. Can you hear me? Yes, sir. Yes, we are yes, Carry on. Okay. See, if you look at the 17 uh, ST, uh, Sustainable Development Goals, you know, they're interconnected. They are uh, not stand, stand alone, in my view. <clears throat> and if you're talking of poverty, then then SDG number one, two, three, four, five, six, and eight are interconnected. You, if you if you have hunger, then uh, you have poverty. If you want to have no poverty, there must be no no hunger. Similarly, good health, education, gender equality, clean water and sanitation, and decent work for economic growth. They're all interrelated. They all. Uh, what would I say, reinforce each other to reduce poverty. So if when you talk of no poverty, you have to talk about all of these things. Now in India, what are, if you look at the poverty situation, I will first give you the South Asian situation. The poverty in South Asia generally a uh, little higher in the head country here, little higher than the global. And India's position is even higher in my position, the uh, percentage of people who are poor in India is more than the, more than the global and the uh, South Asian uh, uh, levels. Now, if you look at the trends in South Asia, it's a, it's a good thing to see that, you know, poverty is falling all worldwide, including in South Asia. In some case, some, some, if you look at the world in regions, uh, South Asia is uh, is poverty levels are high, but the trend is negative. That that's a good good that's good news for us. Now, if we look at the poverty situation in India, it's just this is little data. I don't have the up to date data, but I I assume I'm, I'm, in all probability data remains the same. Most of the poverty is is distributed among central and eastern india if you look at the map uh, western india and southern india is uh, less afflicted uh, there are poverty there also but the levels are lower than in say uttar pradesh madhya pradesh chhattisgarh odisha bihar jharkhand and the northeastern states uh, arunachal and all that it's a tragedy it's a, it's a paradox that the, the regions where you have most poverty are also the regions which are most resource rich it's kind of a, a situation that you have in uh, in some african countries are resource rich but the people are poor it's a very uh, uh, interesting scene that means there's something wrong with the use of the resources and the distribution now if we look at uh, the I'm, I'm, I'm a, I'm a uh, uh, hunger person, so it's always the case that, uh, that I look at, when I look at poverty, I definitely look at hunger. If you look at the World Hunger Index, India is quite, uh, is about 102 now in 2019, when it was 93 in 2015. That means in terms of hunger, it's, it's going up. And I suspect after the COVID, if we have the uh, data, we will uh, be a little worse off. Now, in terms of literacy, also you will see we are middling. We have uh, literacy rate at about 63, 64 percent, which is uh, worse than some other countries in the region, including Bangladesh and all. 
Now, the problem with us is that we look at poverty as a as one construct. It is not one construct, it is several constructs. Now, uh, if my way of looking at it is we can look at poverty at the mesal, maximum measure level, where we say there is income poverty, there is capability poverty, there is food probability poverty, and that is one way of looking at it. The other way is at the micro level. But poverty can be interstitial poverty, it can be peripheral poverty, it can be overcrowding property, it can be traumatic property, or it can be sporadic property, and of course, there can be an endemic poverty. Now, what are all these? Interstitial poverty is where you have poverty among 20. A lot of people who are rich people, within that, there is a, a group of people who are poor. We find that in many of the villages in, in uh, where you see Eastern Uttar Pradesh, Bihar, Jharkhand, some in Odisha, Assam, that there are poor people encircled by rich people. That means even their access out of their habitation is through a, a kind of license and use, and they have to go to the land uh, or, or belongings of richer people. Then there are peripheral poverty, poverty people who live in marginal areas. We, I don't need to explain to you. People in the hill tracks and in river ponds, river valleys, and this for the chores of uh, Bangladesh and all that. There is overcrowding poverty. Poverty due to the high density of people living within a very small area. Lot of poverty in Bangladesh and West Bengal are overcrowding poverty. The number of people per square kilometer is excessively hard. Then there is traumatic poverty. This is, for, this is poverty caused by disaster. For instance, if you look at the COVID situation now in all the developing countries, even in developed countries, there will be poverty caused by the consequences of COVID, not only in terms of death and bad health, but in terms of loss of livelihoods because of uh, lockdowns and restrictions. And of course, there is endemic poverty, which is entrenched poverty. The poverty we talked about uh, earlier is, is about endemic poverty. Now, the problem is, now, it, it, the, the, the poverty, is, the causes of poverty for these kinds of poverty, these five kinds of poverty, are very different. And for instance, the interstitial poverty, it is material deprivation and alienation. I am alienated. We are, materially, I don't have enough. In peripheral poverty, there is a material deprivation, alienation, and isolation. I am also isolated. In overcrowding poverty, there is population go limited social services, limited resources, and alienation based on limited services and resources. Of course, traumatic poverty is poverty caused by uh, earthquake or, or, or a disease like COVID or a flood or, or any natural or man-made disaster. And endemic poverty is where you have all of it together. Now, we the other part of poverty in, in, in India is the women. My women are marginalized. You know, there are societal norms which militate against women uh, working or, or having access to resources, ownership of resources. Everything, there are societal norms. There are policies that intended, either unintended mostly, uh, undertaken by the, by the state, which often leads to marginalization of women, for instance, the demonetization. It has hit the informal sector most, and the, in the informal sector, women have a larger share. In fact, in agriculture, which is in the informal sector, uh, women have a very women are in a very large proportion. Of that, for instance, there is also the learned Supreme Court has ordered, for instance, right few days back, that all the farmers, who, amongst the farmers, women and children must go back. Now that. The, 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 the learned Supreme Court did it in its wisdom and with good intention, but in the effect, what it has done, it has it has denied the agency of women. Women, it is it has denied the fact that in the farming system, women have a much important role to play than men, or at least equal role to play than men. So, asking women and women to leave the arena that amounts to saying that okay, you cannot test or you should not protest, uh, men will protest for you. That's not uh, what I would think is a very uh, realistic view of things, or even 
a, a, a progressive view of things. Then there is feminization of agriculture, which is taking place, uh, where, where the men migrate, uh, uh, and then there is a lot of uh, movement to cash crops. As a result, what happens? Agricultural operation remains with the women. This, this is very important. I mentioned uh, in the Indian context, uh, agriculture and women, because even now, 60 to 70 percent of the people live on agriculture. It, the agriculture may, may the contribution of agriculture in GDP has come down, but the number of people who live in the in, or live on agriculture uh, has remained around 60 to 70 percent. Now, what have we done? It's not that the government or we have not done anything. There are at least 31 schemes that the government has run. I, have, I listed them here. I don't want to read them because that will take a long time and will be boring. We have all kinds of schemes. The 32 schemes currently in operation. The most major ones are, for of course, the Manrega, which is the wage employment scheme. And of course, there are uh, other schemes. Broadly, if you look at the uh, uh, schemes, they can be classified into three groups. One is welfare scheme, pensions, for instance, widow pension, and then uh, grant to pregnant women and children. This is just a welfare scheme, or midday meal scheme for the for the kids. The welfare scheme. There are some schemes which are asset creation schemes, like the IRDP we had for a long time. You can take a loan from the bank. The Bandhan Bank is giving a lot of loans. Uh, you can take loans and, and create your asset, earn income out of it. And then there is, of course, the wage, in, wage employment scheme, Manrega and other I mentioned. What happens? These schemes are good schemes, but they do not attack the causes of poverty relating to the five kinds of poverty that I discussed about institute poverty or traumatic poverty or uh, 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 sporadic poverty. Or, or marginal people living in margin. They do not specifically. It's by chance that in some cases they work, in some some cases they don't work. That's what uh, the problem pro pro where the problem is that our schemes are correct, well conceived, but they are not targeted to specific poverty groups. If you treat poverty or poor people as one homogeneous group, uh, then you will make mistakes. And that's I think what the mis what mistake we have done. This is where localization of uh, SDGs will be very, very critical. Look at, it must be decentralized. We have a Panchayatira system. So the system of poverty elevation must be decentralized where it will tackle different kinds of poverty to different instruments. Now, if we look at uh, what do we do? First of all, what we need to do, according to the first thing you need to do is better management of common property resources. You know, common property resources give income, food, food, protein, pallet, fodder, fuel, shelter to the poor people. Actually, it is the only asset that the poor people have. A lot of people have the landless laborers, the uh, daily wage earners. This is the only asset they have. So the better management of resources, uh, common property resources, has to be ensured, which, 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 in which will include uh, the codification of the rights of poor people to use these and uh, codification of the fact that they cannot be privatized uh, without very, very compelling, compelling reasons. So this better management of common property is very important. Because we have not done it, there is a sharp decline in forest, there is a sharp decline in water bodies. Water bodies, this is critical, not only for moisture retention in the atmosphere, but they are very critical because water bodies give a lot of food, a lot of uh, income to the poor, uh, poor people. Common property resources also is a source of income. The second thing that we have to do is with the management of risk. We have seen that when, when in case of idiosyncratic risk, that is for health and health life, the I, people may have insurance, but still in India, the vast majority of people are not insured. In case of covariate risk, that is risk which affects everybody, like the COVID or a or a flood or a or a or an earthquake, uh, there is no insurance. Now we have to manage uh, this covariate idiosyncratic risk. And my, in my view, the state must step in. It has happened in China where uh, crop insurance is fully funded by the state. So you, this this must, we have crop insurance also, 
but the fact is it is a it is a uh, shared scheme the part of the money will come from the state government the part of the money comes from the uh, central government but many of the state government don't have enough resources to look into it and insurance is a less dramatic thing it does not attract vote it does not attract attention so not many people are interested in it and even public they also not interested because it, uh, it, you don't have the insurance money. now if you look at the, the other thing that we need to second thing we need to do, build social capital we have destroyed our social capital. We destroyed our uh, informal organization. We have destroyed our local networks of the poor. We trust in it. Social capital is very critical. We have to build this social capital. In, the, in terms of the, due to COVID, bonding social capital, bridging social capital, leaking, so all three have been destroyed. Very seriously, because bonding and bridging social capital has been destroyed because everybody is an assailant. My next, next person standing next to me, my next door neighbor, everybody is a potential uh, COVID victim and from whom I can be infected. So this, that bonding, bridging social capital has been eroded. Now there is need to look into this. This erosion has taken place in India much before COVID, but now is the time to build social capital. But to do that, we have to rebuild our uh, traditional institutions. We have to strengthen our traditional panchayat. We have Naya panchayat, we have Pani panchayat, we have Ban panchayat. We had elected systems like Dolores and Waladat and Lindo Sips in, in Meghalaya. We have the Hawaii in Kirby in, uh, Kingdom in Assam. So those kinds of institutions are there all over this country. They have to be built, they have to be strengthened to build social capital. Finally, finally it is agriculture. Whatever we try to do, we want to bring people out of agriculture, good, but that will take a long time. To bring 60% of of, of the kind of popular of 133 crore people out of agriculture is not uh, an easy task. It is desirable, but it will take a long, long time. So in the interregnum, it is important to have agriculture. And the agriculture, what we need to do is need a second green revolution. This first green revolution was based on input. Second green revolution must be based on technology, knowledge. We have to take into account both the tacit knowledge that the people have and the explicit knowledge, technology that we, that we have gained. So, when even community-based knowledge is, which, which I call, or, or which is called tacit knowledge, that and explicit knowledge must join together to have a second green revolution. It is only then agriculture production will go up, agriculture income go up, and can support people. Uh, bringing people out of agriculture is desirable. But it is not easy, and it is not very uh, feasible in the, at the in the short run. So, what are what are we doing to do? Go back to basics. Iran's agriculture revolution, production by second green revolution. Iran's agriculture income promote social capital, manage risk, and ensure gender equality. Thank you very much for giving me this opportunity to uh, talk to all of you.